Rachel and I had a conversation this past week about things she might expect going to a state university. One of the things we talked about was that some of the professors she meets, some of the ones she'll have in class and so forth, will be very anti-God, will be very anti-Christ, anti-Christianity. And that would be something that she would have to deal with because that's what our culture is like today. You know, we live in a culture that's certainly gone wrong. It's a culture that is certainly headed in the wrong direction. So, of course, the question is, how do we as God's people live in a culture that's gone wrong? And what can we do to try and affect to influence that culture that has gone in the wrong direction. A great example is an Old Testament patriarch by the name of Job. Job certainly lived in those same type of conditions. He lived in a culture that was gone wrong or was going wrong. But Job was a great example. He wasn't a perfect example, neither are we. He wasn't sinless. But he was a good example of the type of things that we need to do. In Job chapter 1, verse 1, the very beginning of that book, we have this said about Job. And it's repeated more than once in the book. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned Evil, that verse is basically repeated in verse 8. There we have some insight into Job. Owens calls this his steadfastness, his service, and his separation. And that's the three things we want to look at tonight when we look at Job and how he dealt with a culture, living in a culture, that had gone wrong. First of all, his steadfastness. In Job 13, verse 15... This is said about Job. Job 13, verse 15. Job says this about God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Notice what he said. Even though he slays me, I will trust him. Continue to trust him. Not occasionally... But continue. The idea of being steadfast in his trust. In chapter 19, this is said about Job in verse 25. Job chapter 19, verse 25. Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. See, that, that steadfastness, that certainty, that continuing to trust, continuing to know that his Redeemer lives. Job was mature in his faith. He said to be blameless and righteous. And again, not perfect and sinless. That's not what blameless and righteous mean. But he was a blameless and righteous person. When you looked at his character, there were no character blotches. Yes, he made mistakes. Yes, he sinned. Yes, he had... Uh, at times when he faltered. But God calls him by inspiration blameless and righteous. He sought to do what was right, and by doing what was right, that meant doing what God wanted him to do. So when you looked at Job's life overall, that was the pattern. That was his lifestyle. Living a morally upright life, a morally excellent life, a life devoted to doing what God wanted him to to do. But when we look at his life, we see that during times when he didn't do that, he was willing to change. And that's the key. I think that's the key when you look at Job's life. When Job made mistakes, when Job uh, faltered, when Job fell, he was willing to change. Some people aren't. Job was. We go all the way near the end of the book in Job 42. We see this aspect of his character. 
We see this quality about Job. Beginning in verse 40, in chapter 42, verse 1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. Notice verse 6. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. This, of course, was the section where Job questions God. Why this? Why that? And Job realizes here in this section, he responds by saying, I didn't know what I was talking about, God. I have no right to question you. That's what Job says. I, I have no right to do that. You're God. I'm not. And so Job did what? When he saw that what he was doing was wrong, he was willing to repent. As he says, repent in dust and ashes. This was a sincere repentance. Job was willing to do whatever was necessary. He realized he had done something wrong. Job also knew that God was just. That's the, that's the God that Job Served Back in Job 9, we see this aspect of God. In Job 9, beginning in verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Truly, I know it is so, but how can a man be righteous before God? If one wished to contend with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. God is wise and hard and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and prospered? Job said, I know the kind of God I serve and I'm going to continue to do what I can. I'm going to continue to be righteous. I'm going to continue to be blameless if there's any way possible. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to continue to be steadfast because the God I serve is a just God, a wise God, a mighty God. And no one can go up against him, as he says, who has hardened himself against him and prospered? Rhetorical question, nobody. Job says, this is the God that I serve. Being steadfast required training the mind. Of course, that's where it starts. There has to be that, that internal determination and will to be steadfast. Job could not allow himself to be conformed to the people around him, to the culture of his day. And that's always been true of God's people. Paul told the Romans, the, the church in Rome, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this culture. The culture in Rome was not a culture that Christians should try and be like. So he said, don't be conformed to this society, this culture in which you live. Paul said, you need to be transformed. But he said, that transformation starts inside by the renewing of your mind. That's why Satan works on our mind, because he knows if he gets our mind, he's got us. He's got us. So Job, Paul, knew transformation started inside. So if we're going to be steadfast like Job... We have to start in our mind. We have to make that determination to be steadfast. He also knew how important it was to be steadfast in worship. In worship. Back in the very first jap chapter, verse 5, we see this uh, exemplified in Job's life. Verse 5 of Job chapter 1 says, So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Talking about his family and so forth. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Regularly. I'll get it out. Constantly. That was his habit. In other words, worship for him wasn't just something done occasionally. 
It was part of his life. It, it formed a pattern of his life. Job knew that he, his life needed to be centered around being steadfast in worship. Worship was that important to him. He mentions worship later on in the book as well. So he never, he never shirked that responsibility. We must not either. If we have any possibility of affecting our culture, even the culture here in Granby, we get close to home, then our community needs to see that we take worship seriously. It's important that as they drive by, they see cars out front. That's what I'm talking about. It's important they see that. Well, those people are pretty serious. They're here on Sunday night. Or as they go by on Wednesday night. Well, they must take their religion pretty seriously. They're here on Wednesday night. So it's important that our culture sees that. Our community sees that. Toward the end of the book, again, in, in Job 42, this is seen in verse 8, where it says... <clears throat> Job talking, or uh, God talking about what the sacrifice needed to be. Now, therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. <clears throat> Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you've not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. This was God speaking to Eliphaz the Temanite. See, the, that was important. See, Job was steadfast in his worship, in his prayer, in his sacrifices and offerings. And our community, our culture, needs to see how serious we are about what we do. About our worship. We don't just show up for a few minutes once a week. That will never change our culture at all. Ever. It, it will not ever have an effect. They need to see how steadfast we are in our beliefs, in our worship. They must see that. The next thing that was important in Job's life is, is he lived in a culture that was, that was going in the wrong direction, that wasn't godly, was his service. And what an honor... He saw his service to God. He saw it as an honor. He knew what his priorities were, in other words. No, he wasn't perfect in them, but neither is anybody. But he remained focused on them. And he didn't allow all the trials of life to completely turn him away from God. In Job 2, beginning in verse 3. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of his ashes, of the ashes. And his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said, Do you speak as one of the foolish women speaks? Shall we indeed accept good from God? Shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Our society, if we're going to change it and affect it and influence it, needs to see that about us. That our priorities are not about this world. But our priorities are heavenly priorities. In other words, they need to see that our focus is on God, not on self. They need to see that we're not a church that's concerned about and focused on fun and entertainment and having a good time. They need to see that. That we're focused on heavenly things, not things of this world. 
In Colossians chapter 3, when Paul wrote to that church, he gave them some similar advice in the first two verses of that chapter. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes, verse 1, if, you, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. See the focus there? It's on seeking the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33. Job didn't allow all the things of this world, whatever they were, to draw him away from what he knew he should do. Regardless of what those things were, he didn't allow things of the world to take him away from God. At times, when you read the whole book of Job, Job was miserable at times. And I know that because the Bible says he was miserable. He was miserable at times. And a lot of those things may have, if we would have gone through those things, we might have completely shut God out. But he still glorified God. He still glorified God. Remember what we read there in chapter 2, verse 10. He remained, he kept his integrity. He didn't sin with his lips. That was Job. This will have a great impact on our culture, on our community, on our town. You know, if they see us dedicated and committed to the service of God, it will affect them. If they don't see us caring about our service, we certainly can't expect them to ever be interested in Christ and His church. And then lastly, His separation. His separation. We read in chapter 1 where He did what? He shunned evil. Or more literally, He turned away from evil. Separation from the ways of the world begins in the heart and begins in the mind like we mentioned a while ago with being transformed. That's where it starts. In Matthew chapter 15, we see this taught by our Savior. Matthew 15, verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. See that separation? It begins on the inside. It begins on the inside with our mind, our will. We have to possess a clean heart in an evil, ungodly, immoral culture. We must stand out, in other words, from those uh, that we live with in our community. They must see that we have higher standards than the world. Ethical standards, moral standards. They need to see that we're, we don't live in the basement. That we live on the top floor. That we have exacting standards and we do our best to stick with them. So separation, Job knew about separation, shunning evil, our speech. Separation has to involve what we say, what we, when we have conversations with people. People need to see that we don't live like the world, that our language is different. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 6, the wise man tells us this in verse 6 of that chapter. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 6 says, Listen, for I will speak of excellent things. Excellent things. And from the opening of my lips will come right things. See, that's what, that's, that's what we need. If we want to affect and influence our culture, our community, we need to speak excellent things. We need to we speak right things. There's two aspects to that. One, Refraining from saying what's wrong, 
what's bad, what's immoral, what's dishonest, and saying things that are good. And by saying things that are good, I mean things from the Bible. Speaking truth. So that separation begins on the inside and is seen in what we say, how we talk, and the, and the topics about what we talk. That is just as important. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we have this given in the New Testament by the Apostle Peter. Because he says, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 10, he uses these words. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 10, he says, For he who would love life, and he quotes from the Old Testament, and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He goes on and, and uses a very similar expression that was said about Job. Let him turn away from evil. That's what Job did. He shunned evil. He didn't see how close he could get to evil. He turned away from evil. He saw evil, turned away. Wanted nothing to do with it. Well, if we're going to change our culture and our society, we cannot participate in anything that is evil, immoral, unethical. Any of those things, we simply cannot do it. So it involves our actions and our behavior. Job acted differently. That's why God points out, look at my servant Job. He's blameless and righteous. He shuns evil. See, he picked Job out for a purpose. Job had no chance of, of changing his culture unless he lived that way. That was his lifestyle. That was his pattern. Those were his habits. Yeah, he failed at times. But so does everyone. So Job acted differently than those people around him. And we must as well. Again, the Apostle Peter... This time in 1 Peter chapter 2, where he says this, beginning in verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. He says, But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, and when they speak, e speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, Glorify God in the day of visitation. Just like Job, we must live in such a way so that people do not have ammunition. You, you, you've heard me say this dozens and dozens of times. Hypocrisy kills a church more than anything. It will kill a church. Someone who claims to be a Christian and comes to church and if they're known in the community as dishonest, immoral, unethical, whatever, that, that church loses its influence. That's why it's so important that we live blameless and upright like Job. We want the, wor the world to see good, good works, that we're living upright. No, not 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 people who are holier than thou or uh, people who think they're better than everyone else. That's not what he's talking about at all. But we must live that way. Because if we don't, there's no way we'll ever have an effect on our society and our culture and our community. We'll never be able to change it. Yeah, we live in a, in a culture that's certainly becoming more and more ungodly and maybe anti-godly is a better description but we still have to try and make a difference being steadfast in all we do understanding our service to God and how important it is and then being separate Job was not perfect he made mistakes but he still stood out 
in an evil society. And so can we. If we ever want to change the world in which we live. That change, of course, starts when we come up out of baptism a new creature. We're a totally different creature when we come up out of baptism. That old man of sin that Paul talks about, washed away. But we should never believe or act like we believe that once baptized, always saved. Because that's as unscriptural as any other unscriptural doctrine. We don't believe that because the Bible doesn't teach it. The Bible does teach that we have to continue to repent and confess our sins. If we do so, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That's a promise. Tonight as our invitation song is led, let us focus on the words and if there's a need to respond, let us do so as we stand and sing this song.